morning, church. I'm excited to be here today. For those that don't know my name, my name is Noah. Um, I'm just another member in the church given the opportunity to preach today, and therefore I'm thankful for that opportunity. And I want to thank the church leadership for giving me this opportunity. Question, have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? Have you ever been accused of something falsely and you were innocent? And I'm not talking about that you, you stood a charge and your slick lawyer got you off because you bought your way out of it or some sort of techna technicality. I'm asking you, have you ever stood trial for something that you did not do? Think about that because I'll ask you a question later on today. Because that is exactly where we're going to go in our message today as we close out our summer road trip series, Ending in Rome. Paul is finally on his way to Rome. Paul, a bond servant of Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, is finally getting the opportunity to preach in Rome. Paul has longed to see Rome, as we discovered throughout the, the summer, with the hope to establish, encourage, and impart some spiritual gifts on the Christians in Rome, but has been prevented because of Satan. And so Paul goes, preaches the gospel elsewhere in order not to preach on another man's foundation. But Paul has always been eagerly wanting and desiring to go preach the gospel in Rome. Paul is going to Rome, and the title of today's message is Preach the Gospel No Matter What. Preach the gospel no matter what. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. Please turn your Bibles to Acts 28, verse 16 and follow along. Uh, but before, as you're doing that, I'll open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the hearts that are here, Lord. Whether they're here on purpose or whether they're here because they have to be, Lord. I pray that... We are able to speak to every heart, Lord, and then they're not my words, but they're just using me as an instrument to, to give the message, Lord, and I would pray that it speaks to everybody here. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, and I pray I don't get in front of the gospel message here today, Lord, and there's just you, and I'm just an instrument again that you so chose to use today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I am not ashamed, he says. In verse 16, he says, when we, this is Luke speaking here, got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he calls together the local Jewish leaders, and when they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, this is an indication that he knows who he's speaking to. Although I've done nothing against our people or our custom of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem, handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted, me, wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving of death. The Jews objected and, objected and I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charges against my own people. Therefore, I asked to talk with you and see you for I am bound with these chains because of the hope of Israel. That hope of Israel is Jesus, the Messiah, the gospel. And my first point this morning is, what are you chained to? You see, Paul was chained to a soldier to his right arm 24-7, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in the future. But Paul was a prisoner of the faith, a bond servant. And a bond servant is more than just any ordinary servant or slave. Many servants, many ordinary servants would sell themselves into slavery because of a criminal past or a needing of paying off a debt. But, and slaves could be sold to a master, and if a master figured the slave didn't pan out, he could sell it to some other master because he deemed him unworthy. But a bond servant, on the other hand, was an honorable and trustworthy servant, and the master loved his servant. And the, the way a bond servant could become a servant or a bond servant is he would have his ears pierced or nailed to the doorpost of the master's house. The master would take this awe or this small tool used for piercing holes in leather and pierce the servant's earlobe to the doorway of the master's house. And this would serve as a covenant between them. It served as evidence, as a reminder that every time that servant walked through the threshold of that house, of the master's house, it was a choice 
to render his life in service to the master forever. The master would accept that servant. He would love that servant, provide food for that servant, and a place to rest for the rest of his life. It was total commitment. If there was no turning back, there was no thought of turning back, it was for life. In the New Testament, the word servant hasn't much changed. It has the same effect. If you were a servant of Christ, that means if you were a bond servant for Christ, it meant that you served the master forever. So in, in essence, being a bond servant to Christ is the highest honor or privilege that we could ever pay Christ. We are to be totally committed and devoted to him, chained to Christ, chained to the gospel for life because of our love for the master. Now Paul was chained to a soldier to his right hand under constant guard 24-7 because being chained to a soldier was a typical protocol for someone who was under house arrest. That meant that a soldier guarding Paul probably interacted with Paul, had six-hour shifts, meaning that four new soldiers got to receive the gospel every day. I mean, just think about the exposure that these soldiers had to have had. They've had to have met Luke, possibly seen the reconciliation of John Mark with Paul. Now the question is, do you think these soldiers were converted by having all these experiences with Paul? If they didn't, they must have been some of the hard, hardest individuals, the hardest, hardest soldiers ever to live, harder than woodpecker lips. However, some, some things happen, though. The same thing happens to people who are chained to something and have to unwillingly hear the gospel. For example, people who come to church as a third wheel because they're forced or they reluctantly have to come to church. They must be converted, folks. We have an obligation here or they will become hard-hearted. And we are warned twice about this in the book of Hebrews, both in chapter 3 and chapter 4, not too hard in our hearts, saying, today if you hear his voice, Jesus' voice, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So what are you chained to? Some of us are chained to the wrong things in life, folks. Some of us are chained to the world. Some of us are chained to stuff, to relationships, to pleasure, to careers, to our families, to money, to children, to mortgages, to jobs, to cars to respect, to time, to, to have a greater influence in life. You dedicated your, your life to this stuff, now you're chained to it and it's chained you down. And as a result, Paul's letter tells us that some soldiers because of, became followers of Jesus Christ because of being chained to Paul. And they joined the first century Christian church in Rome because of hearing the gospel being preached by Paul. And we read about this in First uh, Philippians, or Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Paul says that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the same cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusted in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. The gospel is now spreading through the empire's house. And the brethren who already believed, the brothers and sisters who already breathe, uh, uh, believed, are, have far more courage to speak the truth without fear. Paul mentions how several new believers are now in the household of Caesar. This reference shows that people living and working in the imperial palace were very familiar with Paul's teaching, suggesting that they interacted with each other throughout the entire empire's household. So my question is, what are you chained to? Are you chained to the gospel? Are you chained to Christ? Are you a bond servant pierced by the ear to the doorway of righteousness, obediently hearing and obeying our Lord and Savior? Or are you still chained to the world? And it, Because it continues be, with Paul and some exchange between the Jewish leaders they replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of our people who have come from there reported to say anything bad about you. But we want to hear your views, for we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect. These Christians. The way. An interesting point here is the word Christians only used three times in the New Testament, but the word disciples used over 300 plus times. 
And so they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in large numbers to a place where he was staying. And he witnessed to them morning till evening, explaining the kingdom of God from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them. And when I showed up here this morning, Ryan saw me putting down a couple of notes. And he says, you still writing your sermon? He's like, we don't have much time. We have until morning, until evening, folks. Because I'm going to try my best to persuade you about Jesus using the law of Moses and the prophets. My second point, the message. Paul's gospel remains exactly the same because of the hope of Israel, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is why he's on trial in the first place. He wasn't being tried because of the accusations in which people had stacked up against him. It was because he preached Jesus Christ. And his message never changed though, folks. He said it was because of the Messiah, because of the hope of Israel. It was because of Jesus who died on the cross and was seen risen by the power of God on the third day. It is Christ who stood for the hope of Israel. Paul's message remains the same the entirety of his trials. Notice that the the message focuses on the person and the works of Jesus. Trying to convince them what about Jesus. Paul did not change. He never changed the content of his message. He was a prisoner for Christ, an ambassador in chain whose man's captivity led to the gospel going throughout the entire Roman Empire. And the content of his message from beginning to end never changed and it stayed focused on Christ. Paul never preaches himself, folks. Paul never got in front of the gospel. He only preached Christ. And as he said in Corinthians, all he knew is Christ and his crucifixion. Paul's on trial because of the hope of Israel. He says, I've done nothing against my own people or their customs. He says, the Romans had no case against me. They would have let me go, but these Jews over here objected, so I appeared to Caesar. In other words, he says, I've done nothing wrong, folks. I've done nothing against the Jews, nothing against the Romans, and nothing against my own people. Essentially, it has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything because he's a prisoner, because of the hope of Israel, and because of Christ. Again, we are talking about the guy whose captivity led to the freedom of the gospel throughout the entire Roman Empire. He never preaches about himself anywhere, but only the hope of Israel Christ. Having written four epistles while in chains, while in prison, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians, Paul was on a mission because all he knew was Christ and him crucified. In other words, Paul made his mind up that all he would do was speak Christ and speak nothing except Christ and him on the cross. And as a result, verse 24, some were convinced, but others would not believe. I think this is what's going to happen today when you leave here. Some of you are going to be warned inside of you wh- whether you're going to con- be convinced or whether you, are, wh- that you don't believe. Which brings me to my last point, the method. I want you then to notice that Paul's message has never changed. But his method may have. But the message must never change. Now the point I'm making, it is not that important that we, that we use the same method. Paul didn't. For example, when Paul was in Ephesus, he preached differently so that they could understand. And then the last week, we watched Sam preach in a first-person message, and we learned that Paul preached differently up on Mars Hills, but the message was always pointed to the resurrection. Sam did a great job doing that, and Sam never got in front of the, res- uh, the, the message of Christ. Sam never got in front of the gospel. He didn't preach himself. He preached Christ. And then when Paul was preaching to those with a faith background, Paul changed his method for them too. And we need to learn when it's necessary to change our methods. However, I'm not saying it's essential. Because sometimes we can choose a method that is not exclusive to the truth, exclusive to the kingdom. And instead what we'll do is we'll change our methods for inclusion that points to the world, that points to experiences, and it points to what people want to hear just to prime the perversion pump, which is not the gospel, which is short-lived, and it's not rooted in truth. Paul's method was always rooted in truth. He used persuasion and conviction, which is precisely the way it has to be. You know, last week after church on our way home, I was, uh, we stopped at the grocery store to get some food. 
and I saw a guy who I know to be a preacher in the town that I live in. He built this church overnight. It took in a lot of people, and he came in the church, and it looked like he was in construction clothes. And I had made the assumption that somebody else had preached for them, and I said, did you preach today? And he's like, no, we only meet up every other week now. And as a matter of fact, we took July off because Jesus took the summer off. And their motto is a church for people who don't like church people. We're warned about this in 2, 2, uh, 2 Timothy 2.4. For the time will come, come where people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit their own desires. And they will gather around in great numbers of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Consumer services, music, comedy, and stuff is what they'll gather around for. With that said, we must, we must admit, folks, there's way too much pressure on us. There's way too much pressure on the church today because we are constantly changing our methods to reach the world. We want to keep changing things, sometimes just to change things, which sometimes is an indication of our loss and confidence of the gospel, followed by us not being sure of the message anymore because we're just constantly changing our methods. Folks, the method can change, but here's the deal. The method serves the message. We're not here to entertain you. We're not here to give you a feel-good experience. We're here to preach Christ in his crucifixion. Not ourselves, not Jesus Christ, not ourselves, but Christ. And we are to serve as bond servants on the account of Jesus. We can't be flippant with the gospel, and we can't be flippant with our sins. So Paul gets to Rome, and he calls for the Jewish leaders, and he uses a method that he uses many times. He uses persuasion. They denied hearing anything about him or the letters from Ju uh, Judah, furthermore admitting having knowledge about the sect, the way, the Christians, implying that they got this very bad name, this very bad rap, saying that this Christianity is spoken about and spoken against everywhere. Now, do you really think they were truly ignorant of Paul's existence? I think they were just being reluctant or refusing to be forthcoming by just playing dumb. In other words, they were acting like our modern day politicians, having denied any knowledge or association, because that's what politicians do. They lie. I said it. There were already Christians in Rome, folks. If you read the book of Acts chapter 18, we read about Priscilla and Aquila and how Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome because of the riots that were happening over Christians. Of course they knew about the Christians in Rome. They had to. They were just being political about it, though. And then so he preaches from the law, the Torah, the prophets, focused on Jesus Christ and how he fulfilled the promises of God. And then so in verses 23 through 24, he's preaching to this packed house, preaching the, mess, the message of Christ for the hope of Israel. And notice, it's not about Paul of Tarsus. You know, if you read it, Paul only tells his conversion story twice. That's because he's on trial. And then you read about it once on the road to Damascus. Paul never preaches himself, folks. He preaches Jesus of Nazareth. He preaches the gospel and he offers them Christ morning till evening. Imagine what that had to have been like, being in that packed house hearing Paul preach and unpack Moses, unpack the law, the Torah, the prophets' prophecies, hearing Paul preach with conviction and deep persuasion the kingdom of God, trying to convince them about Jesus. What a great effort that had to have been. And as a result, some were persuaded, some were convicted, and some were unconvinced. Imagine the silence over those who were persuaded. Are you persuaded? Are you persuaded that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who willingly, obediently chose to die for the Father for our sins? Is there a silence over your life? Have you gone from being convinced to being committed? And in verse 25, it says they disagreed amongst themselves and they began to leave after Paul had made his final statement. Again, that will happen today. Some of you are going to depart leaving 
questioning your salvation, questioning where you stand, or questioning whether this is real or not. And Paul continues to quote the prophet Isaiah, the same prophet that Jesus quoted in Matthew 13 and in Mark 4, saying the Holy Spirit spoke the truth to you when your ancestors said through the prophet Isaiah. Go to the people and say, you'll be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's hearts have become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand in their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Church, are your ears closed? Are your eyes closed? Have you become callous? You know, on the way here to church, I was reading. No, I wasn't reading while driving, but I was listening. And I think Revelations 19, verse 11, is a good verse to pick up here. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a man on a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That is our Jesus. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp sword, which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads... The winepress of furry on the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh is the name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. That is the Jesus we serve. I pray if your eyes are closed and your ears are closed, I pray that you stop and you turn so that God would heal you. Therefore, I want you to know, like he says in verse 28, that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. And after he had said this, the Jews left arguing vigorously amongst themselves. The passage ends with the Jews arguing once more because of their stubborn opposition. Church, we're here to worship God this morning. And that is why we are here. We are here together to seek his will, the gap, good, acceptable, and perfect, Romans 12, 2, and meet him in our joy and in our needs. We are here to hear Christ proclaim from the scriptures. So if the method isn't suitable for you today, please forgive me because the only thing that matters is the message. A theology of worship that points and aims to Christ and not ourselves as sinners, not our songs, not our relevance, not to you because it isn't about you. It's about Christ. So my question this morning is, are you convinced? Are you persuaded? I'm not asking if you enjoyed today's message or enjoyed this sermon. I'm asking you, are you convinced? I'm asking you, are you personally persuaded about Jesus Christ? If you are persuaded, then your life has to produce fruit because you're changing and you're convinced and you are persuaded about Jesus Christ living the life of a Christian. Now, for those who remain unconvinced and unpersuaded, I don't know what to tell you so long as you refuse to acknowledge Christ as your Savior. And if someone here has the answer, please speak up now. Please share it. Because I don't know what to do with a hard, hardened heart that refuses to listen to the gospel of Christ. For those who are convicted, are you you committed to being the morning till evening Christian? A full-time witness. Not just 45 minutes here. Are you committed to being a Christian morning till evening? Are you preaching the same message over your life and trying to persuade people about Jesus Christ and not yourself? Are you trying to convince them about Jesus, the one who restores a sinner to God, the Father? Because Jesus, by suffering on the cross, paid the debt for our sins to wash away the penalty. So in closing, in Acts 28... We see Paul's unwavering commitment, preach the gospel, undeterred by challenges and adversaries. It went unhindered. And his example should serve as an inspiration for us to embrace the same zeal and dedication in our own lives. 
For two whole years, in verse 30, Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who would come and see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught them about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. And Paul was stayed in imprisonment for two more years, but then eventually got out and then was rearrested. But Paul continued to preach the gospel no matter what. So let this be a reminder to you that the gospel is just as much relevant today as it was then and is just as much necessary today as it was then. May we preach with great boldness, overcoming our obstacles, trusting in God and faithfulness without hindrance. Let us preach God no matter what. Knowing that our obedience can help change lives and change our own and essentially advance the kingdom of God, folks. Because I asked you a question, have you ever been charged with something that you didn't do? I'm going to ask you something that only you can answer. If you stood on trial today, would there be enough evidence in your life to commit you, make you guilty as a Christian? Would the charges be that you are chained to the gospel or chained to the world? Would the charges be that your message points to the truth or the message of perversion? Would the charges be that the, your method points to the cross or points to yourself because you're deaf, you're blind, and you're hardened? My hope is, is that you're guilty for the hope of Israel because all I know is one God. All I know is one Son. All I know is one spirit. All I know is that this world was made perfect and everything in it was made perfect and we were made in his image. All I know is things were perfect until we decided to be disobedient. And all I know is God could not stand that broken relationship. All I know is he sent Christ to be crucified so that we could have that restored relationship. All I know is one message. That if you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you repent and turn away from your your sins, if you confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior at baptism, you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of your sin. And then you have to live a life of obedience. And all I know is one method, and Jesus was pretty clear on that in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I will be with you before that. He said, teach them to obey all that I commanded, and I will be with you until the very end. And for this reason, Hebrews chapter 2 nails it. Right on the mark. For this reason, we must pay close attention to what we have heard so that you will not drift away. For the word spoken through angels proved to be unutterable, unchangeable, and binding. Every transgression and disobedience receives its just penalty. There's no getting out of this, folks. Whatever you do in darkness will be revealed. And so then he asked a question that only you can answer. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? All I know is Christ and him crucified. Are you persuaded? He was trying to persuade them about Jesus. Are you convicted? Let's see your conviction through commitment. To God be the glory, would you stand with me? Lord, we love you. What's even more concerning, Lord, is that there's people here that love you that know there's others that don't. There's people here, Lord, that are going to leave here today wrestling with the truth, unpersuaded and unconvicted, Lord, and they don't have to wrestle but they will because of their own stubborn opposition. Lord, and for those that are already in relationship with you, Lord, I pray that we live that morning till evening witness and we continue to live our life trying to persuade people about Jesus, not about our church, not about anything else other than you, Lord, not about ourselves. Let us be that morning till evening Christian, Lord, preaching the gospel until the day you call us home. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things.
Amen.